Well, thank you uh, for joining us for uh, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America's Boston Virtual Book Fair. Uh, my name is Brad Johnson, president of the ABA, and I'm very excited about uh, this, our very first uh, virtual book fair tour. So before we welcome our panel of our participants, I'd like to personally invite you to spend some time shopping our virtual book fair. We have more than 175 exhibitors from, uh, from around the world, some great offerings, many exclusive to this platform. So take some time, look at the fair. You can reach the book fair by going to abaa.org slash VBF. Uh, the fair is gonna remain open until 7 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday, November 14th. And one more little bit of housekeeping before I make the introductions. We are recording this session for later viewing. And if you have any questions or comments for our panelists, we encourage you to write them in the chat function and we're gonna do our best to get to each and every one of them. So, um, so we have a distinguished panel of guests who are gonna take us on our tour this afternoon. Uh, first, we have uh, Jim Meehan, bartender, journalist, and author of the PDT cocktail book and Meehan's bartender manual. Jim has worked in nearly every capacity of the hospitality business for the latter half of his 40 years on the planet. I'd um, also like to welcome Lance Winters, uh, master distiller for the California-based St. George Spirits, uh, my wife's very favorite uh, purveyor of gin. Uh, his contributions to the world of spirits have been recognized with nominations five years running, 2016 to 2020, from the James Beard Foundation in the category of Outstanding Wine, Beer, or Spirits Producer. We're also very pleased to have with us this afternoon, Amy Stewart, uh, a New York Times bestselling author of the Cop Sisters series, which is based on the true story of one of America's first female deputy sheriffs and her two rambunctious sisters. Her popular nonfiction titles include The Absolutely Essential, The Drunken Botanist, uh, Wicked Plants, and Flower Confidential. While they have not been adapted for television, there are a few bars around the world named after the drunken botanist, which is even better. And last but certainly not least is our tour leader, Don Lindgren, uh, an antiquarian bookseller and proprietor of Rabelais Rare Books. Uh, Don is also an in independent food historian who is presented at the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery. He likes to work at the intersection of a book's text with its physical form, teasing narratives from what he sees and forgetting he's supposed to actually sell the books. So with that, take it away, Don. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, I'm, I, I'm joining you guys uh, at the very last minute, uh, which means that I've already finished most of my cocktail while waiting for the tech stuff to work out for me. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, I, I, uh, I really appreciate having you all here. We, I've done this uh, before with, with um, Jim and with Lance, and I'm super, super happy that we have Amy joining us today, because I think, I think it's going to help us, it's going to take us in a slightly different direction. Um, we have, uh, in, in uh, the previous session, we, we started by um, uh, sharing what we're drinking at the moment. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, Jim, if you, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm drinking, um, and then I'll, tell you, I'll ask you, you guys uh, who have designed these drinks to explain a little bit. Um, I'm uh, I'm having a uh, the gin basil fizz right here, which is whoops the gin basil fizz, uh, which is one of the three uh, cocktails we've discussed um, in advance, um, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. But Jim, you want to tell me what what you're drinking, and and then you yeah. and Lance can talk briefly about how these things came to be. Yeah, so the um, I'm drinking the spray tan. It is a non-alcoholic creation. Um, that is, looks like someone we're getting rid of. Uh, it is, um, it, for the LA American Express Centurion Lounge, it's a combination of sea lip spice and Pellegrino Crodino. It is very, very refreshing, especially because it'll go away. And Lance, how about you? Don, uh, I'm, uh, I'm having the, the gin basil smash as well. Oh, uh, nice. It's, uh, it's, even though it's finally getting cold here and starting to rain, it's still a delightful cocktail to enjoy. It tastes like summer, um, and uh, and again, it's a uh, uh, it's a fantastic creation from the the brilliant mind of Mr. Jim Meehan. Uh, we we make ingredients for things. We're sort of like 3M. We don't make the surfboards, but we make the fiberglass that goes into the surfboards. 
uh, Jim takes the, the raw materials that we put out into the world and does incredible things with them and, uh, and is doing a, a riff on a cocktail that uses actual basil leaves. But this one, we distill uh, both Genovese and Thai basil with brandy to, to make a, a beautiful, stable, incredibly uh, odorific version of uh, basil that you could use anytime without going to the market. Uh, and that goes in with uh, a little simple syrup and our terroir gin, which is very herbaceous uh, and, uh, and lime, and then a float of, uh, of sparkling wine. Super, and, and uh, we're gonna be able to take your analogy or your, your metaphor one step back from the surfboard uh, with, of, of Jim to the fiberglass of Lance because we have Amy with us today and, uh, and, and she's I, whatever they make fiberglass out of because she, she'll, she'll be telling us about what, some of the ingredients. Um, there, uh, it makes perfect sense to me that, that the three of us at least chose to, to, to skip the non-alcoholic uh, cocktail uh, for for today, but Lance, you want to just tell just tell me quickly about that since since it is something we we you know it's on the list. We're not doing the the uh, oh I'm sorry Jim you want to do that it's the Jim. yeah it's the um, yeah the spray tan so oh, it's the spray tan it's the Venice Spritz is the oh so sorry it's the Venice Spritz that was missing from the, the Venice Spritz is missing Amy are you drinking are you drinking tea still or did you make any of the cocktails yeah. I'm drinking a plant. Nice. But it, but, it, but it happens to be tea, so the drug of choice would be caffeine and not ethyl alcohol this time. All good. I'm also going with uh, coffee over here. To Another it. important plant that we make into beverages, yes. I like to have the uppers and downers around me at all times. Um, so the Venice Spritz is a play on the Venetian Spritz um, with Lance's Bruto Americano bitters instead of Aperol. Um, and sparkling wine, and, and the idea there was sort of play off of Venice and, 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 and Venice in LA. And I think one of the things that I enjoy so much about making uh, cocktails is they're like infinitely sort of metaphorically referential and they're global. You know, the, the gin basil fizz is a variation on the gin basil smash, which I'm actually publishing in my next book, which was created by Jörg Meyer in Hamburg, Germany. And when I interviewed Jorg about this drink, which has become a modern classic all around the world, Jorg actually created this drink after going to New York and drinking the whiskey smash at Bemelman's and the Pegu Club, yeah. which is Gail DeGroff's drink that's muddled lemon and mint with rye whiskey shaken and served sort of like a cobbler more than a smash. He went back to uh, Le Leon in Hamburg, was doing a seminar with Audrey Fort of Javine Gin, Audrey gave him a book that had a drink with basil in it. He went into the walk-in, brought the gin, the basil out, was doing a gin seminar and mixed up a whiskey smash with gin instead of whiskey and basil instead of mint. And we have a modern classic born in 2000 and, and around eight. So I, I just think it's fun how um, small the world is. With respect to the drink that, that Lance and Don are enjoying, because this is an airport cocktail, I wanted to take the muddling and the, and the messy shaker out of the mix. And so um, the basil eau de vie is, is, a, is a solution. Super. Um, and, and so I think it's only appropriate that, uh, you know, that everybody who's participating with us and that all of us you know, offer a, a, a toast. And I think to, to health has got to be the appropriate toast for all of us right now. So to, to everybody's good health. Cheers. Cheers. Um, to 2021 and, and inauguration day. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask Susan, um, I, I understand you're doing the navigating of the, the other website. Could you uh, steer our background over to the to a keyword search for cocktail books, please? Sure. Let me share my screen. Thank you. So we're gonna do a, a little uh, virtual tour. We're not gonna look at everything. We're just gonna look at a, a few books that are sort of sprinkled about the fair. This is in a way, sort of the way I would be. Uh, do, okay, tr uh, just do the, do the word cocktails. Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah, that's a, um, so um, this is kind of the way I would go looking at the fair. And, uh, but I think all of us might have different things to, to say and notice. 
And I wanted to start by uh, just looking at a couple of kind of classic cocktail books. If you scroll down a little bit, um, Peter Harrington's got a copy right in the middle, that brown rectangle, the, the bartender's guide. Um, and this is familiar to most of us. This is the Jerry Thomas, uh, Dick and Fitzgerald uh, published. Uh, 1887 edition of the Bartender's Guide, which was the very first guide. Um, we don't need to linger on this stuff too much, except to show some things throughout history. Because I want to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, hope, hopefully we can move to to see some stuff that's really unusual. Um, anybody, anybody want to jump in, have a, a comment on Jerry Thomas or the Bartender's Guide, or in the context of what we're up to? No? Okay, let's go back just to the keyword page. I guess the one thing I'll say, I can't not talk about Jerry Thomas. Oh, I knew, I knew you had to. The 1862 edition of Jerry Thomas comes with a, a larger sort of manual for the manufacture of cordials and, and liqueurs and, and other ingredients, uh, spirits, I think, as well. So the interesting thing is that in 1862, the first edition includes of, uh, it's equal parts recipes and equal parts the manufacturer of the ingredients. It's like equal parts Jim and Lance. And then this 1887 lobs off Christian Schultz's manual. It's just recipes. And I think it's also interesting that I believe by 1887, Thomas was, was, uh, had left the earth. So the, the, there are a couple of books that we'll look at today that were published after the authors had passed. So it's always interesting as an author what are they going to do with your book when you're not around to tell them they can't? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and that and that book was in continuous publication. Um, uh, well, ex except for during prohibition, and then the there was the 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 po the the, the po I want to call it post prohibition edition, but it actually came out before that. The, the one with the uh, Herbert Asbury introduction came out before repeal. Um, and, and it's had numerous ones since then. But that, that book has been in publication almost constantly. There you go. Oh, nice jacket too. Right? Yeah, um, super. Um, let's take a look at um, uh, The Giggle Water, which is the, the sort of brick orange book there. Yep. Um, this, is a, this is an example of uh, like what I was just saying about the Herbert Asbury edition of the book. This was published in New York by a well-known commercial publisher, Charles Warnock, in 1928, which is still, uh, oh, there you go, Jim. This is good. Um, you're, and you have a very nice copy. Um, so this, is, this, this book was published still prior to repeal. Um, I, I think you'll find that at least a half a dozen different titles that were sort of popping up right as I think people were feeling a little safer about the, the, uh, um, the implications of publishing cocktail manuals. Uh, at the beginning of Prohibition, you see some really interesting things. Um, I had a little sports book once, which was mostly sports records. And then every 30 pages, there was about six pages of cocktail recipe and then 30 pages of sports records. And that was from 1919. So at the beginning of Prohibition, you see fear of even publishing material about, about cocktails. Um, at the end though, they're starting to get those books out there into the public. And let's go back, Susan, and just take a look at one more. I mean, partially because I think it's pretty at the top of the page, please, on the far right. That guy. That's Jane's Bartender's Guide. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's a, there's a distinction in, within cocktail books that Jim brought up when we were speaking uh, uh, last month. And it's, a, it's this distinction between books by professional bartenders and books by, um, well, I'll call them hobbyists or home enthusiasts. I like home enthusiasts, sounds good. That's, that's what I am. Um, and, and this is 1934, which is when you see this huge landslide of books re-entering after, after repeal and, and spirits are available again. But this was a professional book. Um, and you see the mix right there. And then I think, Jim, you pointed out that in the, was it the 40s or 50s or early 50s that you sort of see the demise of the professional book? Well, one of the interesting things, and I think these are excellent notes by Peter Harrington, the last sentence of his description says that the final page of the book contains an afterwards warning 
that bartenders must uphold certain values to prevent the calamity of prohibition ever happening again. Um, what's interesting to me as a collector, but also as a bartender, who's also a writer, but more a much better bartender than writer, is that the books published before prohibition were almost entirely mostly written by the professionals. And then the books published for decades after prohibition were mostly written by the editors, bon vivants, sort of city guide uh, sort of creators. And so it's almost like as after prohibition, bartenders weren't allowed to write books anymore because they weren't qualified or the profession had sort of fallen from grace or, or from, from being worthy of, of, of writing books. And I think that part of, in my opinion, having looked more closely at some of these books, I, I look at Patrick Gavin Duffy's, his 1934, um, this was the, the first edition of his official mixers manual. And Patrick Gavin Duffy was like one of the only sort of main bartenders in New York who hung around after prohibition. And he was widely referred to as like a sort of tradition keeper for bartending. And if you actually read through what he wrote, he was insufferable. You know, his view that bartenders should be seen and not heard. And most of what he talks about is just bragging about all the rich, famous people he served. I mean, he literally would have been banned at Milk and Honey because one of the rules written on the wall was, you know, I can't say it because it includes a curse word, but it, 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 the, one of the rules is basically don't brag about who's in here uh, and what they're drinking. What, here, what happens here remains here. And so I think in some ways that we have to, it's interesting looking back a hundred years at these books for me, because I begin to wonder like, who is in charge? Who is the like, in, who is the Dale DeGroff of this time? And were they respectable? Because I have to imagine that that some of the, I feel like there's a sort of spirit of bartending that's creative and in many ways that's anti uh, sort of establishment. And, and these establishment figures who were writing these books after prohibition were really boring people. So I could see why they stopped letting them publish their own books. Um. We're going to look at some more cocktail books as we go forward, but I, I, I want to get Amy in on all of this. So uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to want to say one thing about Amy's. No, I'll, I'll wait till we, will we finish this section with her because I, um, it's really interesting and it really, I don't know why I hadn't really, this hadn't struck me before, but um, her book fits the next category we're going to take a look at. And Susan, can you take us to, um, I, I was going to say one place, but take us to um, the, uh, just the uh, keyword search for herbals, please. Yeah, and I have a few books that I've, um, that I've picked out that I'd like to talk about too. Which yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that would be my first question to you is like when you were doing your research or, or just in love with this field, which I'm sure you are based on what your, how, how marvelous your book is, were, you know, what, what were the books you, you know, you were, you, you found that you, you know, that, that excited you? Well, you know, what I tried to do with Drunken Botanist was to go back to primary sources as much as possible. The, um, the literature of booze, the literature of cocktails is even more inaccurate <laughs> and just filled with like exaggerations and just pure nonsense than even botanical literature is. I mean, I thought plant books were the worst for myths and misinformation, but it turns out booze books are. Mm. So, um, so I was always really interested to be able to find these original sources, like what we're looking at on the screen here, to really see what the origins were of a lot of the plants that we end up um, putting into alcohol. And if you want, I mean, do you want me to, sh should I talk about the ones that I found today that are here um, at the fair? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. You can ask well, um, Susan. Ha Susan has these links, so she can do this. Yeah. But um, there's a really interesting, um, from 1790, a book on, uh, oh, well, this is the one. Go ahead and, and leave this one up because this one is so cool. Um, this is just a proclamation. But it, what it's doing is it's banning the disposal of um, 
valuable goods on this Spanish ship, and it includes cochineal, which is a little bug that was used as a red dye. And so it was really important for textiles, but also in booze. And it's still used today to add um, red color to, um, to, to booze. So if you think about something uh, along the lines of Campari that has a really distinctive red color, I mean, cochineal is what's traditionally been used there and, and still is today. So I think that's kind of like an amazing little item to see at the fair. Um, and there's also, there's a book on quinine um, from 1790. And um, I bet, I bet Susan's got it here. I, it's one of the ones I sent you the link to. I do. And, I, if, so you've got it in chat. Yes, bear with me. Sure. Um, but anyway, so quinine is the um, is a is a chemical that we can extract from the bark of the chinchona tree, and um, it's a South American tree. It was um, originally used for for medicine. It's an anti-malarial, and it's still used today as an anti-malarial drug. So what's interesting about this is this is one of those times when they were right. You know, you look at all these old herbals that are looking at plants as medicine. And um, it, it, in a lot of cases, they were straight up wrong. Like they sort of hoped that uh, wormwood would get rid of intestinal worms. It did not, <laughs> unfortunately. But in the case of quinine, it actually did um, treat fevers and treat malaria. And so these books come out of this golden age of, um, of exploration which was really, in a lot of ways, a rather desperate attempt to find medicine for very serious ailments that people were really suffering from. And, and, and so they, they made their way into medicine in the form of plants getting soaked into alcohol. And it's a pretty short step from that to adding a little sugar to make sure your patients actually take the medicine to pretty soon you're tipping a little bit of your uh, medicine into your brandy every night after dinner. And next thing you know, the cocktail is born. So I think it's interesting the way these go from plants to medicine to booze. Um, and I have another one. There's one about a, a genipi, which is a, um, a type of wormwood. So speaking of, speaking of wormwood as a, uh, yeah. This one? It's, it's no. Um, Bear with me. Oh, you, you were there a minute ago. It's the one with that beautiful binding, which is really the coolest thing about this book. Oh my God. So, um, so anyway, it's a form of wormwood, which ends up in a lot of um, uh, vermouths and, and bitters and absinthe and, and that sort of thing. And that's just one of the many plants that's in this gorgeous book. But the amazing thing about it is this modern binding that has actual plants embedded in the binding which I just think is so extraordinary. Um, but again, it's another one of those plants used as medicine that makes its way into, into alcohol. And, and this dates back to when we were scientists were really trying to figure out what these plants were and what they did and describe them and draw them. And you know, this would have been really cutting edge um, science for its for its day. And in a surprising number of cases, it's still pretty good, so it's like still pretty good solid science really with all these plants. And then the last one was the one that Susan just clicked on that's just, just absolutely beautiful. And so there's your, there's your Buddha's hand citron right there. And I just, I just had to pull that one out. This is um, uh, uh, plants from Java, but, um, but in particular, I think this citrus is just extraordinary. And of course it ends up in absolutely everything we drink. Um, and it's an interesting example too of, you know, um, there's all this citrus in, um, in, uh, in kind of tropical climates where it actually doesn't do very well. And so the, the, the rind gets very uh, thick and the fruit is pretty unpalatable, but it turns out that's the very best thing for flavoring booze, <laughs> so mm -hmm. lucky us that uh, it was virtually inedible, but super useful for, for making drinks. I, I want to just jump in for one second and, and, uh, and, and say, first of all, these, I, these were none of the things I noticed when I went through, which is, which is terrific. I, I love the fact that your eye draws you to a different type of material than what mine might. Um, and I'd also like to point out um, that the booksellers, each of these items is being, is being offered by a different bookseller. And I think you've got four different nations represented in the books that you, you chose, in not just in terms of the type of where the book was 
uh, originates, but in terms of the booksellers, this is Alan Foljean from Ontario. Um, we had a Zagoroscope from Paris and uh, Libra de Antano from Argentina. And the first one I'm uh, drawing a blank on, uh, yeah, that's Libra de, de Anton, on, Antonio. And there's one more, and I, I apologize for not remembering that. Because the window, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Um, Yeah, that's okay. It's the quinine, and I can. Um... Oh, that was Dan Tanyo. Yeah, that was it. I think there was one book before that, but that's okay. Um, in any case, Lance, you, I mean, as, as the person who starts to, as the person who like takes those raw ingredients, and uh, you want to you wanna comment on this? Yeah, so I, uh, so start to start to finish here, the, um, that proclamation that Amy was able to, to find out there. Uh, I want to get that uh, because uh, it's, it's fascinating to think, you know, you've got, you've got sailors who have been given the, the ability to go out and plunder the Spanish ships that are going back and forth. One of the greatest treasures that the Spaniards were moving back and forth from the New World back into Europe uh, was was the dye made from cochineal? It was uh, it was a groundbreaking dye in as much as it was a bright red and it was color fast and nothing else could do that before and it and it became the color of royalty for quite a while. It was worth more than its weight in gold. Uh, it was and so to think of somebody finding a chest of this stuff, which literally takes thousands of hours to be able to harvest enough to fill a chest, maybe maybe longer. Uh, to think of somebody dumping that over and dyeing the sea red for miles around them uh, is just unfathomable. I mean, we, we use that right now in the Bruto Americano that Jim was talking about. And it's, uh, it's not an inexpensive ingredient. I think it's one of the reasons that a lot of the larger spirits companies have gone to uh, petroleum-based dyes to color things red. I and mean, we've made a lot of a lot of headway scientifically to be able to, to make red coloring without cochineal, but it's it's such a great, stunning, natural color uh, that I absolutely love it. Um, so Lance, what's it like sourcing that? I mean, you, you're you're not getting that on Alibaba, are you? No, I'm not. I uh, I was uh, I was able to track down somebody who's out on the East Coast who they source it through Peru and Argentina. Um, it, uh, it's this, uh, you, you probably cover this in, in something that you've written, but, uh, the Opuntia cactus, the cactus mm -hmm. that gives us the prickly pear, the, uh, the, the, the tiny lacewing insect, the cochineal bug, um, lives on those and the females produce uh, these egg sacs and they're laden with carminic acid, which is the, the base of the dye. Um, if, uh, if you wander around in a place like, uh, like Arizona and you see lots of Opuntia cactus around, you, you see on the paddle of the cactus, these things that look like dryer lint got stuck yeah. to it. Um, if you go up and you press against that, you're going to get bright red stain on, on where, whatever you press it with that is going to take a long time to go away. That's cochineal that's there. Um, it's, it's being harvested to a certain degree in Mexico as well, but, uh, you know, we're very, very fortunate to be able to have found a, a company that's doing a lot of it down in South America. Hmm. Um, the, the, so that's super fascinating for me, uh, commenting on the, the Buddha's hand citron and going a little deeper into what you're talking about, Amy, um, all the oils that are present in the skin that have the, the, the monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, all these, all these different compounds that are giving us aroma and flavor. Um, the, the Buddha's hand citron itself is uh, a mutation of the citrus medica fruit. Uh, it's citrus medica sarcodactylus. And it's because of the fact that it grows skin over every segment, it looks like fingers. So usually when you, when you look at the flower, each of the different, uh, the pistils inside there is gonna be a segment of the fruit and forming the seeds. Uh, and then a whole skin forms over that. Instead, each single segment forms skin. So for every pound, you've got a lot more skin. And so for every pound of fruit, you've got a lot more flavor potential. Uh, it's a really, really wonderful ingredient for being able to flavor with. In addition to that, it's not just lemony. I, I pick up notes of, uh, of jasmine blossom in, uh, in the Buddha's hand citron. So it's a really, really beautiful ingredient to be able to play with. Um, and then the, the Genevieve book, the, the whole Artemisia family is really, really interesting and cool. 
there's so much that can be done with those. Uh, jumping back to uh, Jim's uh, spray tan cocktail, um, I love the idea of being able to, one, poke fun at jackasses, uh, uh, but two, uh, I love the idea of putting lots of bitter into a non-alcoholic cocktail. Um, because for me, that bitter, when I start drinking a cocktail that's low alcohol to no alcohol, bitter takes the place of the alcohol and makes it feel like it's more substantial than it actually is. Uh, and I don't miss alcohol if I've got that sort of bitters. And, and doesn't mean I'm an alcoholic because I need to find something to replace the alcohol that I'm missing every, every, every time I'm not drinking something alcoholic. Uh, anyway, uh, the, but the Genevieve book is something that uh, I think is kind of fascinating, especially with uh, the actual plants in the binding material. Um, I'm, I'm going to track that one down. Thanks for calling my attention to it. <laughs> Jim, you want to, you, what, you're, you're, the, you're two steps removed from, from the plants, not one, except maybe when, while muddling, but you, you want to comment on, on well, what I you saw there? Comment on, I have two. One would be that my introduction to Lance's work was through his Hangar One Buddha's Hand vodka that like mm -hmm. really, when we, when, you know, before, about 20 years ago, every drink wasn't called a cocktail, it was called a martini. And we, we barely drank anything but vodka back then. It was very hard to sell anything else to people. And so Lance started making these vodkas uh, in California that were made with fruit instead of uh, petroleum-based chemicals. And one of them was a Buddha's hand vodka that I created a variation on the South Side called the Parkside Fizz at Gramercy Tavern back in like 2005. And that was sort of my introduction to his work. And he's gone on and sold Hangers One and now focuses on his own work across the yard, but I, I just think that it's a cool to see Buddha's hand and, and Lance in the same Zoom screen. Um, <laughs> I would also just say that um, that with what Amy was talking about with respect to um, the use of medicinal plants and how it went from a plant to you know suddenly it got you know put into wine or like with kinkinas or it got put into spirits like with absinthe. And then suddenly it got sweetened and pretty soon we're talking about cocktails. If you look back, I like to point out to bartenders especially, if you look back at the history of, of drinks and spirits, it, up until really like maybe like the Korean War, the history of what most people in the Western world drank was the history of what the soldiers drank wherever they were out fighting. And so absinthe became you know was sort of this thing that was created for this the the french army during the algerian war that they needed the wormwood they like the tonic water was created for the british soldiers in in india the um drinks like the cuba libre became popular when the american troops were in cuba the the you can look at the his like like punch was something that was a tradition of english sailors the history of all of our early drinks that going down to like the Pisco punch and the, the sort of trade between San Francisco and Peru went down to either what people who were like traders or, or, or soldiers were drinking. And, and th that audience was, whether it was the robber plunderers or the soldiers were the big biggest audience for spirits and, and mixed drinks. And a lot of those early creations were equal parts, you know, sort of you know, something that would calm their nerves, but also equal parts medicine. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, um, and, and with that, I want to take a jump, jump back into the, the, the tour to look at a couple of additional herbals, uh, things that uh, uh, besides what Amy brought up. So if, could, you, could you give me that herbal page, Susan? Thank you. Uh, and I think herb, herbal or herbals works great. So. And, and this is, it's such a fascinating field and it's been a major field of book collecting for, for, for centuries now. And, and it's partially because this field sits at an intersection of so many different areas. Um, let's, let me just pick one quickly. Uh, um, you scroll down a little bit, please. There, there is a nice, oh, this, uh, yeah, the one with the nice, uh, a brass hand clasp in the lower left. So this is a book, uh, Henry Light's uh, New Herbal. I'm sorry, it's, Henry Light was the translation translator. It was Rembert Doden's. 
Um, this is London, uh, the translation is London 1578. It's being offered by Sokol Books from London um, who, who do a lot with very early English books and other things, but frequently have beautiful herbals. Um, can we blow that picture up? Or just click on the pic and we'll get a... So here's the, this is the author and he's holding a sprig of something, which if I were better at what I do, I would be able to identify easily. Um, Looks like a it, Brooklyn bar manager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and right down to the garters. We scrolled <laughs> through a couple pages there, Susan. So the, the herbals provided, there were, they served a number of functions. There were, there were a botanical record. They're trying to identify through observation the distinctions between these plants. Uh, they then would frequently talk about the usefulness of the plant. And the usefulness might be uh, medicinal, it might be culinary, it might have some other use, like it might make great, oh, you know, dressing for a horse's hoof or, or something. So any type of, of use that you could imagine, uh, they're trying to tease out. And this is both for the practical aspect of use, but also for the economic aspect. Um, things were being identified as products in a way through the herbals. Um, so besides the sort of practical part, the medicinal part, the, the, the scientific botanical part, um, there's also the illustration. And so there are people who collect them for the, the quality of illustrations and for, for them being a really marvelous example of the history uh, or, or of elements of the history of illustration. Um, let's, let's back out of this and take a, a look at a, a different one. And I think there's a, and there's a there's an actual live uh, there's a a real sample herbal in the lower right hand corner which is really a neat one there you go and let's just blow that picture up so you can see that this this is a book that's been this is a, a collection of actual samples of plants that were assembled into this book um, and it's always fascinating to see how they do this because they they would often they would often uh, collect the plants at different times, and then they'd have to put them in the book in, in whatever taxonomic order they were creating. Out. And, and so they, they frequently would make these final pages out of, of other things. And you can see that these were pieces that were cut out of something else and then placed together. And that's probably because they were actually uh, foraged at different moments. And let's just go back and look at the, who, the, who this book is uh, from and by. Great. So uh, this is Lettenauer, uh, another uh, Parisian dealer, and the book itself is uh, is is uh, Paris 1810. And uh, I'm not going to read through that, but you can see that this is an a, you know an herbal with actual live examples of the plants. So you know the herbals living at that intersection. Um, part of that, as I said, was the usage and the. The use could be, again, it could be culinary, it could be medical, it could be household, it could be veterinary, it could be alchemical or magical. And all of those things were frequently occurring in the same, same uh, books because the activities were frequently occurring in the same kitchens with the same pots and pans, maybe hopefully different pots and pans for some of it. But there's a, to some extent, there's an overlap because of practical concerns. And in other, to other extents, there's an overlap because there's no recognition of the line between these different categories, or at least of firm lines. Firm lines really come into place at the very end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, when things get professionalized and specialized. Um, and the reason I wanted to stop and look at herbals is because I wanted to point out that Amy's book is really <coughs> an herbal. And it, you know, the herbals take different forms, the type, you know, the amount of information that, that's given on uh, individual plants varies from herbal to herbal in you know whatever century it's made. But her book is really um, it, you can jump into this with a plant that you have in your garden. You can get a bit of the history of that plant. You can get a little bit of the botanical of the sort of science and the uh, propagation of that plant, and then uh, and then also use, uses of that plant. And in this case, most of the uses happen, happen to be cocktails because that's, uh, or, or drinks, not just cocktails, it's the, the, the broader uh, world of drink. 
So I wanted to stop and go back and look at herbals to just point out that this book by Amy is firmly in that tradition, which goes back, well, thousands of years. It's not just the printed through printed time. It's it's uh, it's uh, much much earlier. Um, and and with that, we let's jump forward to uh, from the plants, and we can you know we'll just go around as we need to as we want to. To um, can we go to Ben Kenmont's booth, Susan? Thank you. And we're going to look at a couple things uh, in different booths that have to do with distilling. Lance, did you mm. take a look? Did you see anything that's distilling related yourself? Because I've got some stuff and. You know, uh, Don, I never do my homework. Uh, and so I, I and, and the last couple of days, we've been up in Mendocino harvesting uh, Douglas fir. So um, I apologize. I, I didn't look, wanted, but uh, I just wanted to see you squirm. So I, I put you on the spot. Um, Thanks, I appreciate that. Yep. Um, and so the, and it's Richardson's Principles is on here somewhere. I think we're going to scroll down. Um, um, stop there for a second, just so I can catch up. Let's see, now a little further. Um, no, these are nice long list, aren't they? Oh, there it is. Yep. So, as there are books on the making of cocktails, there are books on the making of stills and uh, and of other equipment uh, that's relevant for making beer, for making uh, spirits. This is a piece of, of brewing equipment, which I apologize for, but it's um, it was an one important of the nice step. Illustrations. It, you know, it, it it's a uh, um. It's, it's the moment of the, well, what the moment we're talking about is 1788. So, you know, we're firmly in the enlightenment and information is being passed around and scientific knowledge is expanding. And, and the fields of science of the expansion include brewing and wine making and distilling and, and uh, so, well, everything really. Um, and illustration was frequently used in order to explain to people how they could make things and uh, improve their, their, use here. Are you familiar with this, the, with the Richardson plants? No, I'm not. I'm not. It, uh, it, it looks beautiful though. I, um, you know, my, you know, you know a good deal of the, the books that I have on that uh, between uh, uh, halls. Uh, and I actually, I, I didn't get complete distiller from you, but that was, uh, that's a 1757 London that uh, I know we were, we were looking into some stuff on, uh, on rums very few of the books that I have as I was going through all these uh, have anything on on rum production and I think it's because uh, when you look at it and it's very germane because we're looking at uh, brewing equipment right now brewing had many more steps involved uh, and when you look back in the the early 1700s with brewing and nobody having thermometers the steps involved weighing out the, the appropriate amounts of boiling water to be able to bring temperatures to mash in temperatures so that you can hit a temperature level without measuring temperature. Mm -hmm. You're taking room temperature water and mixing it with boiling water to approximate a temperature to hit to be able to convert uh, starches into sugars. So this sort of equipment would be indispensable for being able to do that sort of thing. Oh, very cool. Um, and Susan, could we go to John Kunzig's booth, please? And John has a book that's uh, earlier uh, than that and speaks to, this is the, uh, it's, it's, it's an early book called Secrets is the first word in his title or close to the first word. Um, but this speaks to some of that overlap of, there it is, they're right in the center or next year. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, yep, that's it. So this was the uh, Secrets of, uh, Alex of Piedmont. It uh, was 1588 in Rouen, France, and uh, this this is a book that's primarily alchemical. And but if you click on the second or th I think the second photo in, and then blow that up, please. Uh, that one, yep. It it has um, lots of examples of equipment at work, and I just wanted to point this out to show show the you know the overlap the the stills. 
um, so much of the uh, the types of, of the, you know, the development of chemistry as a field um, is being done simultaneously with um, with alchemy, with medicine, with household uses of things. And in the household, this would have been the province of women in the still room where they would be doing things like preserving and making sense, uh, S-C-E-N-T-S -C -E sense. And, and uh, beer. And, and beer and, and actually um, and cider and distilling as well. A lot of that was the province of women until the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, you know, alchemists and chemists kind of broke off into their own piece, but um, there's still this real overlap and it's visible in books like this. So I look for these, these sort of chemical and alchemical books um, when I'm looking around a fair in order to find images like this one. Um, okay, let's back out of this. And I wanted to look at a couple things that are about the... Um, we can, if we can go actually go to my my page, please, Susan. Be a little self-serving here. And uh, I wanted to look at a couple things that were related to the sort of stuff of of drink beyond the pro the, the process we've been talking about. Um, and so on my page, what am I looking for? The um, there's a there's a trade catalog for uh, for uh, taverns. Going a little bit further. Oh yeah, uh, that's it. Schmidt and Co. Please, that that one. Yep. And unfortunately, I've only got this one photograph because it's the spine of it is rather delicate. But this is a trade catalog, and the sort of thing a, sa a salesman would bring around to his clients. And the clients in this case would have been taverns, restaurants, um, soda fountains. Uh, other types of drink uh, selling or drinking establishments. And it has glassware and straws and uh, napkin <clears throat> dispensers and uh, all sorts of other odd equipment that might be included in, in such a thing. But this is an example of the kind of items that are pre you know, present out there in the world that, that give people a better sense of, of what was going on at any one time in, in within the drinking establishments themselves. And we think we know, but clearly they're selling playing cards on the front page. So that's an important item to have. Although that's not a big surprise to us, but it's, it's kind of nice that we now have proof. Um, and let's back out of this one and look at one other one on the page that uh, Mr. Boston trade catalog, uh, the, the bright red one, there it is. Almost cochineal color. Um, this is uh, surprising. We're all used to seeing Mr. Boston books being this big, right? So this is like when I, I assume people when they see this think it's this big, and it's not. It's 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 this big, um, and this was actually issued, you know, with the title "Old Mr. Boston" on it, a year before the first book that Ben Burke Co. Offer, issued that had the title Old Mr. Boston Bartender's Guide in it. So it, it's interesting that the trade catalog actually preceded the bartending guide. Um, there you go. Um, that's the 35 first edition, right? Yeah. Yep. Do you have any, do you have any of the, uh, the, well, there are two, there were, there were uh, two titles that preceded it, but not called Old Mr. Boston. Let's see. What do you got? Okay. I got these two. There are different okay. editions, and then I and the, have the red, the first red book I have. Started. Well, what you need, and and someday they will reappear. Um, I, I is there's a book called 100 Cocktails, and then another one called 120 Cocktails. Mm -hmm. um, there were it was published in 32, and then the second one in 34. And um, there might have been an additional printings in there somewhere, but I've never seen this book here. Yeah, I haven't either. And, and I, I, I'll point out that both of these books uh, are, uh, are, are what we call unrecorded. And I don't, I don't like to emphasize that word too much because that just means that like 12 people are going to go home and pull them off their shelf and say, oh, yeah. 
Uh, but it means that in the in the world of of recorded paper stuff and all of the all of the world's uh, reference libraries, all of the bibliographies that are relevant, uh, including the giant giant Noling uh, uh, bibliography of beverage literature, which is well out of date but still very useful. Um, that both of these uh, trade catalogs are are not uh, present in any of those things. And it's an example of how a trade catalog is ephemeral. It was never intended to have long-term use. It was intended to be used for the 1951 sales season and then thrown away and replaced with the 19, or 1935 one and then thrown away with the next one. <laughs> so they, they, they don't survive as well as some other things. Um, and then can we go to John Bale Book Co, please? And there's a really sweet, um, I never know if he's under Bale or, oh, there he is, or John Bale. And there's a, a really sweet little label catalog here, label collection. And it's the first collection of spirits labels assembled by a young girl that I've ever seen. Mm. There it is, yep. And, and, <sighs> Presumably a parent wrote, Liz's collection of labels, et cetera, trip to Europe, 1963, age 10. <laughs> and let's just look at a page with some labels on it just to get a sense. So this is, you know, this is both a, 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 a sort of, I don't know, a sweet little piece of nostalgia um, and an object which, you know, contains a lot of graphic history you know, graphic design history, which may not have otherwise been collected. That's one of the great things about label collections is just the more sort of random they are, the sometimes the better they are. Can we see a, di a different page, Susan? Oh, that's fun. <laughs> and, you know, look at the way she put them in here. So you, they're tipped in on one edge, so you could, you could sort of pull them up and look at them. And somebody organized them with the words, word white wine, which I don't know whether she was aware of which labels would have been white wine and which ones would have been port or whatever. But um, so there's just tons and tons of graphic design history. And, and you know, when we spoke last time, um, you know, Lance and, and Jim, we, we talked a lot about design and design history and the influence of, uh, uh, well, we talked a lot about that, and and Lance, I you know you you even dabble in printing yourself, which is which is terrific. Uh, Amy, you weren't with us when we had that discussion. You have any thoughts about this? I know it's well outside the plant world, but do you. Well, it's not. It, it, yeah, I mean, you know, what's cool about these old labels, of course, is that the um, the really strong design elements are the plants, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all this, all this, what, what we look at, and we we think, oh, it's just ornamentation or it's just decoration, and and it's actually quite a lot of botanical art. I mean, even on this one random page, you can you can see that you can see leaves and grapes and flowers, and um, I thought I I thought I saw maybe a suggestion of hops somewhere in here. So, uh, you know, all, all that stuff is telling you a little bit about what's in the bottle. Absolutely. And, and actually, there's a, uh, I had a collection of, of labels, uh, English spirits labels from pre-1850. So they were all pre-aniline dyes. And most of the dyes were natural dyes. And you, you could look through these labels and identify that there really only were like 12 or 13 colors. Um, and as opposed to this like whole range of color that we see nowadays. Um, and I've sort of taken it upon myself to learn where, where these colors that I see over and over again in, in, in early 19th and, and, and earlier uh, centuries come from. Like what, which plant made this red or, or, or cochineal if it's that. Um, it's really kind of exciting to know that the plant is actually in the label, not just on the label. Yeah. As a big dum-dum, I mean, I sort of learned about that myself in the last couple of years. And it's amazing to go to a museum and understand the some of the older artworks that you're looking at. I've always read about how artists mixed their paints and how mixing paints was like a, was a craft or like an art basically in addition to painting. And, and then my dumb self realized, oh, if you wanted to have a, a 
a purple color or a red color or a blue color that had to come from a natural ingredient that had to be acquired and then mixed into something that you could paint with. So the, the idea of painting in color was based on whether you could source natural ingredients that were of that pigmentation. Yeah. And that pit painting certain colors would have cost you a lot of money <laughs> because a purple color or a red color or a blue color was a very expensive pigment to make into paint. Yeah, and that's still true today. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, um, I'll try to tell this really quickly. Um, there's a story that cuts, cuts into all of the things we've been talking about today um, that I wasn't expecting to talk about, but there's a color that's referred, or a type of paper that's referred to as sugar paper or sugar blue. And you see it a lot in the late 19th century, early 20th century, or sorry, late 18th, early 19th century books on, on, as a sort of like printer's binding material or sometimes just as a wrapper. There's a blue color and there's a pinkish purple color. And it was a scrap paper. It was collected by scrap dealers after its original use. And its original use was as the wrapper for sugar being <laughs> shipped to New England from the Caribbean. <laughs> and this paper was this sort of chalky blue color and it, 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 was, it was actually originated in, in the 1600s and um, sort of both in England and in Germany. And at some point people figured out that it would react to adulterated sugar. And if you put beet sugar or grape sugar or something else in with the cane, pure cane sugar, the blue paper turned purple or pink. Now we know that of that as something like litmus paper and that it was reacting to the acid, it was reacting to pH. But, sugar, you know, but bakers and candy makers in, in, in New England just knew that it guaranteed that the product was pure. So they liked this blue paper and tons of it came to New England and then got disseminated into colonial and early America, early, you know, United States uh, uh, moment and reused in printing. So there's this interest and the reason it came to New England is it was one leg of the triangle trade. So it's connected to, it's co connected to sugar. It's co connected to rum. It's connected to molasses, which then was made into more rum in New England once it got there, um, and it became this scrap that was used by printers and also housewives. And it's just this crazy piece of scrap paper, but it's got all of this history. And if you walked around the whole book fair, virtually or in real life, if we could, you'd, you'd probably see a hundred books on the floor of that flat fair that are made out of this or covered in this scrap paper that's connected to the sugar industry, the rum industry, the slave trade. It's got this huge piece of history in this little piece of scrap paper. Wow. Um, and I, I wanna, we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of bumping up against our time, but I, I, there's something I wanted to, to jump off to a, a very different topic um, because I, it's something we've talked about at, uh, in, in various like non, in sessions that weren't here, uh, in a warm-up session once. Um, could we go to yesterday's gallery, um, please, Susan? And at one point, we, uh, The Ideal Bartender, that nice big bright book right there, bright red book. Um, That's my holy a, grail right there. There you go. Well, well you, can, you can jump off of this in a few minutes and, and run out and get it. Um, it's a beautiful copy of an exceptionally rare book, uh, and 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 a and a really important book. And uh, this is the the ideal bartender by Tom Bullock. Uh, it was published in 1917 in St. Louis, um, and it's recognized as the first African American. Or Bullock was recognized as the first African American to publish a cocktail recipe book. And can we look at that? There's a photo portrait of the author there. That one, yeah. There we go. So here he is, Tom Bullock, wow. African American bartender. Um, and I wanted to make sure we stopped here, uh, or or that we saw, see this, and and maybe one other thing. You know, we've looked at all of these things through time. We've sort of seen books that came from Latin America, that came from from uh, from Europe, that come from uh, from North America. We didn't get much to other parts of the globe. Um, 
but you know, in one of our conversations recently, we talked about how how a certain part of the sort of celebrity celebrity I don't like the word, but the like well rec the recognized professionals in the spirits world and the bartending world are not often enough. Uh, I'll say diverse in, in, in any way, like you can, uh, whether it's there, not enough women, not enough African-Americans represented. And I, I wonder, you know, if, if any of you want to speak to that in the sense that the, in, keeping in mind that we have this marvelous piece of history in front of us on the screen that, that shows that it was there all the time, it, or, or maybe percentage wise, not where it could be, but still it was there. Yeah, well, you know, this is this is something that I thought about with um, with drunken botanist. I really thought about looking very globally at the plants that we turn into booze, and it was really apparent to me, sort of hanging out in the cocktail world, how much you know we focus on North America and Europe. Um, when when you take into account what everyone drinks in Africa, and and throughout Asia you get a very different picture, even from the plant perspective. So I was always asking myself, like what plants are most often turned into alcohol, like just sort of by bulk. And you'd think it might be grapes or barley, but I'm actually convinced that it's sorghum and it's sorghum because of Africa and it's sorghum because of, because of Asia. So um, yeah, you know, I love to see us taking a, a global perspective and a, and a perspective that's less focused on um, on the white men of, of North America and Europe, which is definitely, unfortunately, how um, history gets told. Absolutely, and and, and I, I think that the it's it's an interesting thing that's happening in the in the book world, and and by book world I mean I mean booksellers, but also librarians and collectors and institutions that they're actively seeking materials from underrepresented groups of all sorts. And that that includes, um, uh, it, it just basically means that we're not just finding things in categories we might expect them to be in, but in unexpected categories like in, uh, in drink history. Um, there's a, a, a manual published in, in, Shanghai, uh, in, in Hong Kong I have for um, Chinese uh, people moving to America. It was published in Hong Kong and it was basically like this is the this is the what you're going to have to cook if you're going to go into the restaurant or if you're going to go in, if you're going to be a cook in America you need to know how to cook this and it's basically like you know Delmonico style hotel food, but it also has a 20 page section at the end of cocktails, and it's it is in Japanese. All the ads in the back are for are, uh, I have, there's a Chinese one and a Japanese one both that do the same thing, but the. There's an ad, ad in the back for um, all these different businesses in Los Angeles that you can connect to that will sell you the food items you need, your clothing, the, their boarding houses. There's a place you can buy Chinese records and a cocktail section. And, you know, that's in 1917. It's remarkable, but it's like this, the, it, it speaks to the experience of those people and what they're, how they're going to enter the cocktail world more than it does about what cocktails are like in Asia. It doesn't talk about that, but there's a whole group of people who are going to be entering the workforce in their new homes. And that's exciting. And there's one more picture, I, I, and then I'll stop um, with the pictures at least. Uh, uh, can we go to Tom Congleton's booth to between the covers? Please. Hey, before you, before you leave Ideal Bartender or just before you move on, I just want to say that I was an African-American studies major in college and uh, obviously a bartender for since 1995 as well. And it's tragic that there's a book that just came out, where did I just put it down? Um, this, this past year called Tiki, Modern Tropical Cocktails by Shannon Mustafer. Um, and in talking to another, a number of other sort of journalists and writers, the, it's horrifying. This is the first book that has been written by an African-American bartender in America since that book. Wow, so wow. We believe that it's been, I mean, there, was, there are some others from the 60s and 70s that someone can probably drag out, but this is the first major printed book by an African-American bartender in 100 years. Um, and I think that the, um, 
this is a book that was published in London by Douglas Ankara called Shaken and Stirred with a beautiful picture of a woman holding a martini that is obviously not a white woman um, that is filled with some beautiful pictures of black bodies and black hands that are not caricatures, caricatures like you see in so many of the books in the 40s and 50s, which, which really have some just downright racist imagery um, depicting African-Americans. And, and I just think that when I look at that ideal bartender book, it is, it's both um, an incredible book because of when it was printed, 1918 was like right before prohibition, which was like the apotheosis of the American craft cocktail tradition. So this was like as good as it ever got to drink in America was that time. Um, the Ideal Bartender was blurbed by George Herbert Walker Bush the first, I think. So it was actually blurbed by the by the by the grandfather of the of the future presidents. Um, it was, I think, Teddy Roosevelt made a comment about hmm. Bullock's juleps being the best juleps in the South. Uh, and the book itself is impeccable as an example of of a classic American bartender's guide. So in addition to his bona fides as a as a really like bartender of the stars who didn't brag about it. They bragged about him instead of him bragging about them, like like Patrick Gavin Duffy did. Um, he it is just a it's a really important important book and it is exceedingly rare. I think the last time I saw, it only comes up very rarely. The last time I think it came up was for ten thousand dollars. So I hate to say it, but seventy five hundred bucks is a is a good price for a book for that book. Um, it is the like my holy grail book and I have a lot of grails. Uh, so I would buy that if you have that kind of cheddar laying around. But I would say that like when I look at that book um, and when I, you know, especially with Amy on the, on the line, if you look back at the history of the import, what I would call the important drink books in the Western cocktail book tradition, it's shameful that, that they're 99.9% .9 written by men. There are very few women represented and there are almost no African-Americans either. So um, things are thankfully getting a lot better. But when we look back at our history, it's just, for me, it feels shameful. Um, yeah, it, it is. And especially given the fact that the, the history of, uh, especially of, Af of African-Americans uh, is so tied up, is so frequently tied to the service professions. You know, the very first uh, Robert Roberts um, House Servants Directory, which some might argue is the, the earliest American cookbook, American African American cookbook from the 1820s, long before Melinda Russell, although it's mostly a, a, a household directory and only partially a cookbook. But there's, you know, the, the, they've been behind bar, you know, behind the bar and, uh, and serving and creating and uh, offering hospitality to people for for centuries, and yet, you know, it's a field we know they were there. It's you know, other fields you might say, oh, they weren't there. But this David one wrote there. about, and I mentioned it in my book, in the sort of history um, section. I believe Dabney was one of them. There were two bartenders from like Virginia, North Carolina. I'm trying to quickly find their names, but Dabney was one of them and I, I'm forgetting the name of the second of them, but there were a few African-American bartenders of the late 19th century that were the, what David Wonders has called the sort of first celebrity bartenders in America. And, and they don't have books like Jerry Thomas does. And I just think that as, now that we have a, a new uh, administration coming in and, and Americans are gonna begin to finally, hopefully, begin to grapple with our America's original sin of slavery, I feel like hopefully that some of these stories of some of these um, African-American bartenders in particular will start start to come to light. I know Dave will be publishing the Oxford Companion of Spirits and Cocktails either at probably the end of next year, which will hopefully, you know, begin to bring those stories more to the fore. Yeah, and and I and I do want to look at that last picture that from, uh, uh, um, between the covers, if we can, Susan, and and which which is right to, to this point, it's that photo album of the African American nightclub scene. Um, and I th I think we go to the first actual page of photos. So this is a this is really remarkable. This is a photo album from Alaska, 
uh, which was the, the fact that it really struck me the most of uh, mostly from a, uh, a gentleman who performed in a, in a band in Alaska, but in, this is all related to this one nightclub. Um, and I, I wanted to show this because it's highly unlikely that we're going to find more than maybe one or two future cocktail books or distilling books by people of color that pop up that nobody's ever been aware of. It's, it's, people have been looking and, and maybe, maybe there's something, but I doubt it. But there is other types of material that's out there that, that can help to build the record of the history of all different kinds of people in the cocktail world, the spirits world, the, the I mean, it, every part of this. Um, and photo albums are one, there's all sorts of other stuff. But um, to know that there, you know, there are things like this that are surfacing now, and, and you know, somebody hopefully in the future will take a close look at this and start to uh, you know, use it as primary material for their research. And uh, I think it's just fabulous, you know, it's just, and it's not just like the, just about the, the bar or the nightclub, but it's also about people getting together and gathering and doing what we all do in, in better times than this. Um, and so I, I'm going to probably leave it there. Lance, I, I, you have any, I'm sorry that I feel like I stepped on you there a second ago. Did you? <laughs> no, no, we're all good. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to then ask if anybody has any questions. I don't, I mean, I, I don't see any ch questions that popped up in the chat, but if anybody has one they want to throw at us quickly. Actually, there was a, um, uh, there was a question early on, uh, Jim, uh, the book you, sh you showed, you picked up two books early on, and, and one of them, I think, was the, the person was asking, what was that book? And it's the, it was the, the Jerry Thomas from 19... Yeah, the Herbert Asher, how to yeah, just to clarify. Yeah, so that's the that's the first Knopf edition, right? Is that the yes, yes, and uh, and that's it's uh, it's extra cool because it's got the introductory material by Herbert Asbury, whom, whom many people know from from uh, as the the author of Gangs of New York. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions. Does any any of you panelists want to ask any of us anything? <laughs> no, good. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm good. Um, uh, well, I, and the last thing I wanted to would say was to congratulate Lance on that great screensaver he's got behind him. I I got to find out where he downloaded that from, so I could get the same one. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's actually, available on stingshortspirits.com. You, you should just sell that. I would. I I pay five bucks for that behind and uh, behind me in a zoom presentation um, i can finally retire yeah <laughs> <laughs> um amy thank you for joining us for the first time i i really really happy to um here to push this back to the plants where it all starts and oh, where thank you so much my time. pleasure yeah thank you and good luck with the next the next book um, i'm always thrilled to see what's coming out next and Jim uh, and Lance, I'll, I'll see you guys on the road. And uh, thank you, thank you all. And thanks to uh, Susan I, and Brad for their for their tech work in the booth or wherever they are. Yeah, yeah. Th th thanks to everybody, uh, Amy, Don, Jim. Uh, great to great to be able to chat. It's really lovely. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank thanks, 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 everybody. Bye, guys. Cheers. Bye.